Hey, everybody. It is the Dev Talk Show on October 21st of 2020. Uh, I'm Chris Gomez along with Andy Schwamm and Rich Ross. So, hey, one of the things we do as developers, right, is uh, is we we write code. That's why we're here on the Dev Talk Show. And one of the things that web developers do is write, create APIs, which is just, I guess that's our kind of catch-all term now for a service mm -hmm. sitting on the web that people call into and get information that they need or maybe post updates or or whatever you need. But tonight we're going to talk about enterprise APIs. And um, that's a term that I'm only kind of sort of familiar with. So I'm really glad that we have Rich here to guide us through the beginnings of, of enterprise APIs because, you know, what I'm here to find out, Rich, is what what is an enterprise API? Well. Great question. And I think what we might want to do is take it back a little bit and think about, you know, we've talked about APIs on this show a good bit between some of the technologies we've looked at to build APIs. Uh, we did a show, gosh, over a year ago at this point, around gRPC, right? Uh, probably around yeah. this time a year ago with .NET. Core that was a good showing. one. Yeah, that was a really good one. Um, but those kind of, uh, those kind of uh, API, APIs in general are things that we need as developers, right? Things that we need to um, be able to get our applications to pull information into those applications. So if I ask you guys, what is an API? What would you say? Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's not an application with a client or a front end with, with the menus and all that. And it's mm -hmm. not, before we started building APIs, we usually connected back to some database. And so I think APIs today pretty much are always access, almost always accessible over the internet, but maybe not. I guess you could have an internal one. And we almost always mean a web-based API, although that was a good point that we do have things like gRPC now to do something similar. Yeah. Methods. <laughs> What do you think? It's methods that you call or resources that you query or post to? Um, Chris, you that? said that um, that it needs to be web-based, and then you said, but we have gRPC. Isn't gRPC web-based? How, how is that different? No, uh, no it is, but I, I, what I mean is that we, uh, we have web APIs using HTTP, but now we also have other... You don't have to use HTTP. I mean... We have gRPC. Oh, so you, well, you said, okay, so you're talking HTTP versus web. Yeah. Okay. We don't have so, to use HTTP methods, but. Yeah, I mean, do you think a, uh, in the big picture, is a is a SOAP request, you know, like, is WCF an API? I, I think in the big picture it is. It's not what we generally mean when we talk about APIs today, right? But but I think it, it's an API. Sure. Yeah. Um, and then SOAP you know, falls into that bucket, right? Yeah. Yeah. Another thing I think of with, Again, maybe like the more modern API, right? Again, because we're talking about this just different ways. But I tend to think of the more modern APIs as being like sort of often more fine grained than the older APIs where you can do, you know, very specific things, low level things, you know, and, um, you know, it used to be this giant like maybe it was like this giant submit call. But now. You know, we have these little parts. Maybe we're submitting pieces at a time or we're getting information back and forth. You know, I just tend to think of the APIs as being more, I don't know if that's the right word, fine-grained, but more specific or yeah. detailed. So maybe maybe an API is, is okay, it's, a, you, you, it's, it's something that your application can reach out to both to receive data but also to, to post and update data. Uh, and I'm not trying to use the HTTP verbs intentionally, yeah. but you're not, it's something that's abstracting you from that actual resource. You're not, when you call an API, I don't know if it's what it's going to. I don't know if it's going to a database or is it making something else happen? Is it the API may not actually go to a database. It may just uh, call exactly. another service that I'm not aware yeah. of that turns a light on. I don't yeah. know. Yeah, But and that's irrelevant, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I think you guys have hit on all of the really cool, important characteristics or properties you might have when you think about wiring up an API. Um, but the important part is it comes down to essentially a contract. However it is you do that communication, whatever it is you're passing, whatever 
uh, you're trying to connect to from one side to the other is what's that contract? As a client, what am I gonna pass to this API endpoint such that they're going to give me something in return that, that I need for my application? And if we think about things from a contract perspective, then you know, APIs kind of cover a wide range of different technologies, protocols, uh, locations, implementations, data sources, all of those things, right? Yeah, yeah, that's pretty good. You know, you're making me think of like another term we used to use for contract. And I have actually hear some people use this for APIs as well as they, they call it an interface, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, the I, you know, right? we could say, what's that? That's the I. That's the I, right? And right. so <laughs> it could be, well, that's, yeah, that, that's actually true. I hadn't even really even thought about the acronym. Oh, wait, API is an acronym. Yeah, wait, what is, what, what's the, what is it? What's the application programming interface? Is that what yeah. it is? Okay, we're yeah. done. All right, we'll Goodbye, roll the credits. Right. We'll see you all next <laughs> week. About that. Just uh, before but, Halloween. You know, so it's it's that inter if we take it like that way, that contract level that you were saying, Rich, and then we have interface as the contract. And... But but it's it's something that's exposed over the web. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Whether it be the open web or the private web, that's not that wasn't the point, right? But like it's exposed over the web, usually via HTTP. But we've talked about other things, right? Maybe that's the definition there of what is an API. I think you know. Yeah, and I think if we think about it in that way, you know, we can start to. You'll see, as, I guess, as we go through the rest of the conversation, you know, that will. That opens up what a lot of different types of things could be in that when we think about API. It's just that if we focus on the contract, there's a whole bunch of things that open up for us. Um, but it's kind of interesting there because you mentioned one of the things that, that we think about when we when, when you think about APIs is, well, how accessible are they, right? Are they, you know, are they private APIs? Like you may have in your organization, you know, at least right now when you build, um, let's just think about the app that you might build. You might have a private API that's on-premises, not, uh, shareable with anybody else outside of your organization and but for your application because it resides in that network that certainly is something that uh, that works and is, is plausible to, to put in place um, but you might also have other APIs that you connect to maybe there are platform APIs for uh, larger applications that you purchase or third-party applications that you purchased right so being able to if you have some uh, ERP system in your environment, it might have APIs that you're able to connect to and, be, and are able to uh, to start to bring in. Um, you might also have APIs that are from your partners. Uh, think of them being able to share out APIs that they might have because you your data is stored with them and you want to access their services and access that data uh, to include in your apps or to do analysis on it or what have you. So you might have partners who have APIs that you have. Um, and then there's also you know software as a service where you basically bring a license and, and connect to those APIs. So there's a number of different API landscapes, if you will, where those connections and contracts might need to take place. Private, they might be public, they might be shared, they might be per license, if you will. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think that puts it pretty clearly. Okay. Yeah, and free and and and, uh, and paid, right? Subscriber APIs is another, I guess, category, right? Exactly, exactly. And I think the context of everything we've talked about here is I've got an application that I'm building, some client app or some web application that I'm building, and I want to be able to connect to those services wherever they might live. And I'm going to do that via that API model. Um, if you think about APIs that you might have for your organization, you might have um, those capabilities uh, that you're exposing from your backend line of business services to other applications and clients and what have you. And while that, you know, might be, has started as kind of like a one-off of thing because this application needs to access our specific line of business data, what if you start to move beyond just the capabilities of one application and start thinking about it from your organization's perspective of this data is important to our employees. How do we surface it and make it available to our employees we don't know what applications they're going to write. I think, you know, Chris, to your point, you were talking, we don't, we don't know where the data is stored on the back end. Well, as an API writer, I may not know what application the user is going to write, but I know that they are going to be interested in this service, this data, this, this, um, this capability or um, mm. this, this contract, if you will. 
uh, and included in their application. So if we think about APIs that way and not just point capabilities against an app, but actually a product that we can, um, at least from your employee's perspective, have a little bit of an economy around, uh, not that they're purchasing anything, but they're at least saying, hey, I, there's a value here that I can include in my applications, then that starts to change the discussion and the thought process of how you might create those API uh, contracts and, and how you might start to scale those out. Yeah, that's interesting. You know, I'm thinking uh, as you're saying that, I'm thinking about how like, you know, often we're building an API because uh, if it's an internal API or external or whatever, but because there was some request came and someone asked for this data usually, right? That, that in our case. But but what you're saying, what I'm hearing from you is, you know, we, it's important to think about, well, sure, I'm building that API because maybe Chris asked me to because he needed this address data or whatever it was, right? He needed some kind of data from, but if I do it right, then this is something that I don't really care how he uses it after this or how other people use it. If I've built it right, where you were talking about that sort of economy out of it, where you can get like, Hey, we, I've just enabled my organization to do more mm -hmm. because of the, because of the data that I'm, um, let's say the data that I'm exposing in this case or something like that. And that's, that's a really cool way of looking at it. Yeah. Yeah. Unlike a purpose built, you know, sometimes API, where, which you where the only reason you might have built it is because you were going to build this front end and because the architect in your organization doesn't allow you to connect straight to the database anymore. Mm -hmm. So you build this API like like you haven't you haven't really built an enterprise API in that case. You just built a service that helps you do something. But it sounds to me like what we're saying is an enterprise API says this is complete, maybe not complete, that might have, this is access to my system and service, both maybe complete, maybe based on whether you're a customer or not, maybe based on permissions, and then go forth. And, uh, you know, go forth. And uh, so when we see this with the big, when we talk about APIs for some of the big services out in the landscape, whether it could be a well, I just said weather. A weather API is a simple example, but even if it's controlling a big service like YouTube, you know, um, sure, we can go to the YouTube portal and manage our channel and do everything we want to do from there, or we can use their, their API and build the product we need. Mm. And uh, they're just they're they're just trying to come up with an interface that lets me do that. So that's interesting. I hadn't. I hadn't thought about how differently you think about an, an enterprise API from just like, oh, you know, this is the technology we're going to use to get to the database. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, I think it, it's interesting because as you're saying that, uh, as you guys are saying this, it makes me think more about what, when we started this and, and Rich is asking us, what is an API, right? It's, it's almost like, wait, that's actually what an API is, okay? Yeah. The stuff I've been building is what Chris, you know, not I've been building, but you know what I build a lot of, what we build a lot of is what Chris is talking about, where I have a UI and I have this purpose built API, you know, again, I'm using the air quotes around it this time. It's an API, but it's very purposeful. It's really just as a mechanism to get the data from my application, like you said, it, you know, and what we're talking about here is a true application programming interface. Let me build whatever application I want to build with that interface, right? Just exposing those little parts. And it's, that sounds like maybe all these other things we're talking about, and maybe we, we, we call it API because of things like, well, in the Microsoft world, we have MVC Web API, right? And so we started using Web API to drive our user interfaces and things like that, right? And so we said, well, we're building an API. and. Right. Maybe yeah, was... maybe we should be more careful about that terminology and call an API API and come up with something else for those other things, you know? Yeah, or the other way around, leave the AP, the web API component where it is, and the other whatever this other thing is, let's figure some name to call that. Um, I think hmm. you're right. When you did that, where did that API reside? It resided in your project, and it was kind of locked into that space, and it was updated with the rest of the application, and it had a life cycle with the rest of the application almost, right? Yeah. 
Yeah. You know, sometimes I find another user that might use it once in a while, but we I get nervous about those kind of things because I'm like, well, but we built that API for this particular product and we might change it and now someone else is using it. You know, it yeah. wasn't really made to be, you know, I'm sure you guys have seen those situations before, mm -hmm. right? Definitely. I guess what's happened in that situation, and look, we've all done it. I've done it. I've probably done it recently, is we've really just built a three-tier app, mm -hmm. except that we used a web front end, and then we used a, a, an API as our business right. tier, and then, and, then it, and then it goes back to the database, right. <laughs> which is what we did before anyway. Yeah. So, um, and you have so, business yeah. logic potentially in that API oh, business tier, might right? have. and now it's it for might. your... And if somebody else wants to use it, that reuse kind of becomes a problem because they may not want oh, yeah. to do that logic the yeah. same way you do. I didn't yeah. bother building authorization or thinking about, you know, how, uh, an authentication strategy or any or federation strategy. None of that happened. Yep. And all of those, everything we've talked about here are things that we need to think about as we start moving away from API just being a capability and actually thinking of API as a product. So we start thinking about things that can help build out the scale, right? How can we do reuse? How can we um, increase the capability of versioning and, and get those APIs out in, and uh, uh, available to developers who might want to include them in their application? And then also kind of that, um, you know, the customers being the application developers, what's that consistency of experience, right? Being able to know that here's where that contract is, that contract is, I can go and check it and make sure that it continues to be that, uh, the same contract, I give you this, you give me that. Um, but if it doesn't, what's that versioning, right? How can I make sure that I can move on to that next version? Because uh, inevitably things change, new data needs to get put in there or new features get put into the API. So being able to make sure that I know what that contract is at the point in time I want to access it. So all of those things are when we start being able to, to kind of move beyond and start to think about this as a product essentially. Um, hmm. Yeah. So it sounds like there are some general principles you need to think about and even um, categories of things like you just talked about versioning, which we hadn't even touched on yet. Yeah. And actually, there's a, a question in the chat now asking about uh, <laughs> just <versioning>. came in. <laughs> um, ah, that's always the struggle I have, by the way, with with APIs, e even those application type APIs. But anytime you get multiple users and you want to add features and and you get into versioning, that's where, I don't know, I, I struggle. I have a couple of theories. I'd like to hear what, what Rich has to say about this, but I, you know, I've got a couple of tricks I've used, but I don't know if they're the best, quite frankly. Okay, and there's a couple of different ways to even break into the topic of, of versioning, right? Where you think of what's the version of the actual endpoint API versus how am I going to create different versions of my of my API? A little bit of a subtlety there, right? I might have, uh, if you think about how I might create different versions, right? I might add additional features to that API, but I wanna make sure I do it in a way that doesn't break it if somebody else is still using um, using a slightly older version of the of the API, right? So a version 1.1 one, one versus a 1.0 version, right? And I've got a little bit more capabilities, but I've got, you know, still some backwards compatibility for those who are still on like that 1.0 space. And then thinking about it where I'm going to make this, well, this is going to be a version 2. And typically when we get to something like that, it becomes a bit of, well, it's breaking, right? I'm, I'm there. I may leave some people behind who can only access version one, but these new features, because maybe we restructured how our APIs are called, the data behind the scenes of how we organize the models, that means we're gonna go off in a different direction. So I think, you know, you're thinking of your APIs more like a product, right? Just like you might version your product with minor versions, little enhancements, little features, little bug fixes to keep things up and running. And then at some point you're gonna say, well, hey, this is our brand new version of, of our client application. This is what you need to be looking at and what you need to be pointing to and the old one's gonna go away at some point. That same product mentality has to happen in the API space as well. I, I know Andy, you had some thoughts, but. Well, yeah, I do. Uh, I, I'm thinking, trying to follow along with what you're saying. One of the one of the questions I always wonder about with APIs, and I've seen it done in different ways, is that sometimes with API versioning, the the version is actually like the, a, 
like the previous code base. Like I've seen people do it where they leave that application is there and the next version is like another, you know, sort of literally another version of the, of the code. Right. Um, and so I guess maybe the first question to ask and to think about versioning, if, if you don't mind my asking these questions here is like, how, how I've, how do we trigger which version I'm using the word trigger. I don't know if that's the right word, but how do we request yeah. the API of version one or version two? I've seen it done in a lot of different ways. Yeah. Um, I don't like have my, my personal feeling is I don't like it having it built into the, the short part of the URL where it's like, you know, part of not the domain, but like really built into yep. the route because yep. then you can't really get rid of it. You know, like I don't want to leave those old versions around and stuff like that. I've seen it done with query strings uh, and I've seen it done with um, where I've done it at times when if, if it were, let's say we're posting data or even we're requesting data and it's, a, it's an object. Sometimes we'll even have like a version attribute in the data that comes in that says I'm posting this data in here, but I'm using the version one or version two or version three, because maybe even the data, maybe even the the object that I'm pushing into this API has a different shape than it used to have. And it, it you know, so there's all these questions that come in. So what ways do you think are best for, for sort of triggering the version? Is, is that a requesting the version? How, yeah. Let me see if uh, yeah. Let me see if I can bring this up here one second. Uh, it's interesting. I can't. I can't wait to see what Rich shows us because you you talked a little bit about it. You talked about the URL itself containing the version. So, for example, your API might be like devtalkshow.com slash API v1. Yes. And then and then slash the resource, which in our case might be shows or a show list. Or uh, maybe a, a list of the MVP for the show, which you know would just always return me. So we don't really, you know, we just that's just a static file. But but seriously though, um, there are the ver there are versioning camps, and I think that's what we're getting into. So I can't wait because uh, this gets to be like some people make this into a real war. Like they're very they're okay. very um, dogmatic about like this is how it should always be. So I, I loved. I can't wait to, to hear this. Yeah, so he's showing one example here. Yep, yep, yep. Um, and this is, which is I think, this is. I don't know. I don't know. One necessarily is any more common over the other, but it certainly is one that I, I've seen a lot of, where it's in the URL itself. And when we go ahead and we go yeah. to um, version two, and then that's what we basically get. We get v two slash shows. Yeah. And then the idea being is that there's some breaking changes between shows one or the APIs from one and the APIs of two and such that I can't do this anymore. I really do need to say show and one, you know, maybe something like that, right? The whole, the yeah, whole method yeah, calls. Yeah, right. um, so by the way, going back to what you said earlier, right? I, my, I think the best advice is avoid those breaking changes. You talked about that, right? Like not versioning is the best way of doing versioning, right? <laughs> I think. Sometimes you need to. Right. Some, of course. There are, of course. Well, yeah. There are things yeah. you don't know when you first launch an, an API and, you know, what might right. be considered an enterprise API until people start using it and you start saying, hey, this is this is really taken off. We need to think about this or we need to add some additional functions because people are asking mm -hmm. for this feature request. So then the other one I, I was talking about, like with a query string, have you seen you've seen that done right with a query yep. string? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you do HTTPS. Uh, I probably should just copy and paste this instead of watching me type. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is really in, in those cases, like both of them are are URL based updates, where the URL is is telling it part of the URL one way or the other, query string or path to the resource right. is stating the version. So the question that we have from uh, Open yeah. Window 365 is, do I recreate all of the endpoints from V1 into V2? And I think, I think, and I, listen, I want to make it very clear. I think the three of us believe this is a discussion and we're going to have some guidance. And then at the end, we're probably going to tell you that there are ways that work for everybody because not everyone is doing the same thing. Right. Um, but uh, I feel like if you, if you adopt patterns like we're talking about here, then doesn't, then that can free you from implementing 
all of the exact same resources and routes that you did before. So maybe if, if for whatever reason shows just doesn't work for you anymore, mm-hmm. um, maybe the dev talk, I know we're pretending this is the dev talk show API. Maybe the dev talk show API isn't just doing shows anymore. Uh, they, they also, there's also books. Like there's yeah. this whole book, this whole series of books now. And so people are coming to this API and they want, they want the, the, the list of all dev talk show resources, educational resources. They don't just care if it's a live show or a book. So maybe V2 or V3 just abandons the show route. Right. But it doesn't mean you have to. No. Yeah. And, and maybe it's something a little more under the covers than that. Maybe we get to a point where we're no longer doing open ID or some OAuth 2 kind of protocol for doing authentication. We're doing whatever that mean next is of that. And we want to deprecate all those previous APIs such that you need to update up your game and get on the latest version or getting on the latest ways of doing authentication. Okay. And that's what that right. next version might be. Open API being, um, it used to be called Swagger and it is a standard, um, I don't want to call it a contract, but um, I mean, I feel like what makes, right? yeah, it's what makes open API tick is if you follow that kind of standard, then it's easy to create clients. There's, there's like, uh, there, there are generators that'll create clients for you for various languages and even create documentation for you with the whole, with the swagger, um, and even test beds, right? Like, uh, like if you, if we ASP.net developers use swashbuckle, we get that whole like built in test bed and everything. Yeah. So uh, that's that's pretty cool stuff. But um, and by the I, way, wait, did you just say that op- uh, it used to be called Swagger, I, and so I it's think, not called as of when is it not called Swagger? So I think that Open API, I believe I'm right about this. This is the, is is they decided that they wanted to kind of standardize on it, and 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 so Open API is the official name for Swagger. But the problem is, so many of us know it as Swagger that they you're never going to get away from the term Swagger. Mm-hmm. But I think if we go to the Swagger site, it's going to say open API. Oh, boy, I better be right. Otherwise, I'm checking you know, now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm just doing. curious. So Mike just says the platform for building APIs with Swagger is what Swagger is. Swagger.io. Right. Yeah. But then see how it says the open API specification. The power of Swagger starts with the open API yeah, yeah, specification. Yeah. And that came second. Right. First came Swagger. Second came the name open API. Um, point. Some of this is history, too. I, I have a feeling we might talk about other ways that APIs are versioned. And there is a historical reason why URL came first. And it was because of the immaturity of mobile. That mobile devs could have never done any of the other ways. I mean, and there was a time when mobile devs had get and post and that was it. Yeah. So things like patch and update and put, they, they didn't have any of that. And that's that's there's some historical reasons why some APIs would accept it would accept deletes as a post and the and and, uh, and we would be like god that's awful that there we've got these verbs in http what's the matter why don't they just use delete well because it's not in the mobile operating system so oh well mm-hmm. and um now some people like url just because they say look ease of use easy to explain you can explain it to anyone easy to document easy to code people can hit routes no problem people know how to do that in their sleep yeah. Um, people can curl routes, no yeah. problem, you know, but then there are the, uh, why are we using URLs? URLs are supposed to represent a resource and then, and you start to get angry and that shouldn't be how we do it. And so I, I don't know if you plan on talking about some of those other things or if that's not part of the conversation. I wasn't, but this is an open okay. conversation. It's a talk show. So I'm, <laughs> so, um, so let me, we, instead of dwelling on it, what yeah. I, what I, what I will do is I will put in the chat a classic blog post from Troy Hunt. Okay. This is the classic post from his in 2014 where he said he was building the Have I Been been Owned or Have I Been Pwned API, yeah. and he decided there's three major camps. URL, a request header of some kind that tells you what API version, or the, the quote-unquote absolutely positively correct way, an accept header, that, that already follows the definition of the web that tells you what you want. Yeah. And he said, there are these three camps. People are very passionate about them. So I built an API that respects all three. And his okay. approach became popular to sure. the point that people have built libraries 
and refer to this blog post. And I mean, I went and found it because it's a classic. People have built libraries that will without so that basically you don't have to worry about it. You say, here's my API and uh, library, go forth and make sure it respects URL, custom request header and the standard accept header. And it just does it. And so I would recommend uh, take a look at that. And, yeah, and while, is, while you're is talking 2014, which is, is downright old by, you know, so I, I would assume that Troy stands by this still. I mean, Tr Troy's yeah. a pretty smart guy and he probably would have replaced it if, if he didn't still stand by that or something like that. But uh, but that I don't know. I, I don't know about this idea of supporting all three. If we're building an API for our customers, I feel like why should make well, it depends on what you're it. trying to do. What, What's that? But it, so he's building a more general purpose API, right? Like he yeah. wants the world to engage with it. Yep. Yeah. Although you're true. not wrong, Andy. You're not wrong. It's a lot so of work. In, to a, in an enterprise it. API setting, which we may get to this, you might be delivering client SDKs so that the customer doesn't have to implement the, uh, yeah. the, the nuts and bolts web stuff. In that case, maybe you should tightly control it. Yeah. Where mm. this is more of a, I want have I been pwned to be accessed and used by everyone to be implemented everywhere. Please go forth and 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 make the world better because you're you're using my API. So let me make it easy for everyone. I I I don't necessarily think those goals are always your goal might not be the same. Yeah. Yeah, right. And when you think of I mean, I'm sure maybe not, but I'm guessing by your comment you're thinking, well, I've got to implement this in my application where my APIs are hosted and that there might be, well, that might be, there are, when, we, when you start thinking about moving beyond just uh, APIs as capabilities and as prod and thinking about them more as products, there are actually products that can put over top of those APIs that can handle some of this for you. And you can basically say, well, I want to enable as, as Troy Hunt would probably recommend all three for my APIs mm. and my developers who have access to them have the capability to pick and choose the one they want because they all work. Yeah, that's cool. If you, you know, if you extract that out to another layer and I hadn't thought of that, I have a feeling I know where you're going with some of this because we talked about something on a show once before about a layer on top of your APIs, right? Yeah. But uh, I'll save that big reveal for you. But uh, it, it is interesting. Um, you know, it also sort of makes me think back to um, uh, Web API, which is kind of equally supports uh, JSON or XML. Mm -hmm. as, you know, and so it, it it's sort of along that same lines. Like if you want to build an API and you want people to use it, um, and and if it's easy, why not support all, right? Why not be there for everybody, yeah. I guess. Um, so that's kind of cool. There probably was a transition period where you needed to support XML and JSON. Uh, I think it's fair to say we're probably we're probably past that. Well, you know what? But I don't know. I don't know maybe if that's not for everything. True. Depends on who your customers are. Yes. Believe, believe me or not. You know, we do have another question here yeah. from uh, Hector HSC. Uh, what API style do you use? And um, I'm, I'm trying to interpret that question myself and, and yeah. I don't know what you guys think. Uh, I'm assuming this is Hector. I, I can refer to this person as Hector HSC, but, um, maybe a little more information on that question. What style do you use? I wonder if, if, uh, Hector is referring to, you know, like a rest API, oh, okay. uh, versus a non rest API sure. or something like that. I, I, that's what came to my mind. I right. don't know if I'm right about that. Um, right. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, the other comment that we got a little bit. Oh, wait, though, here it goes. Oh, wait. Are you asking about whoops. GraphQL, REST, or SOAP? And yeah, yeah. H Hector saying, yeah, Hector HSC is saying yes. So we're on the right track there. Definitely. Um, so do we want to, you guys want to answer that and, you know, throw some feedback? I'm, I, I certainly, I mean, the answer I have around that is that it, uh, you know, it's the old consultant answer of it depends, right? Each one of those has their proper or not proper has a, you know, kind of maybe a more preferred uh, way of um, more preferred use case, essentially, or some some patterns or some, uh, you know, peculiarities to those 
styles that might make them a little more difficult to do certain things when it comes to management or or uh, or tracking of, of information. Um, so just to I mean, obviously, we all know rest um, as being, you know, kind of when we think about, you know, writing applications, that's kind of a standard uh, uh, set of uh, or a style that we might use to, to uh, make our, our web requests into. Um, and it's certainly ubiquitous, JSON over XML. It is, you know, kind of the, I don't know, um, do we say de facto standard for people who are making, you know, uh, RESTful calls for from their applications. And for most applications that might be, that might, that might make sense and that might work. And REST might be what happens from the client to some intermediate API layer um, but you might have other a REST service that then goes and calls another service that might be written in another language or using another uh, framework, maybe using something like Go because it's more, um, uh, might be a little better performance on the environment that it's in. Um, the other ones that Hector, or I'm sorry, not Hector, but Open Window mentions around GraphQL, uh, that uh, language that basically got created by uh, Facebook and is a way of, um, you know, kind of optimizing uh, that HTTP based interaction. Uh, so it's such that you get like one single query URL that has all of your queries packaged up in it to just return the data that I need for that page. You might have a REST API that talks to a GraphQL API that talks to some other service that packages that code up and then sends it back up to the REST service. So the right location for those for those calls is, you know, part of the architecture discussion and the design session when you when you start building out your your uh, your API environments. Um, same thing would happen. One thing that's not mentioned on there, but we talked about it earlier, is gRPC. Right? You might want to use that in the same kind of model where I have a REST service that talks to a gRPC service, because um, gRPC is better at handling service-to-service -service connections and being able to make uh, make requests around you know maybe the in inner workings of your environment where all your data or your business information lives. So you might have again a REST service that talks to gRPC or even a client that talks to gRPC directly. So um, it's a matter of, you know, kind of mixing and matching those styles at where it makes sense based on where the, um, the kind of traffic you're trying to send through. So I don't know if you guys have, have thoughts or comments around any of that. Yeah, I, so I agree with everything you said, but I think I can take a slightly more opinionated and short answer. Go for it. Uh, to, to the, you know, viewers that might be wondering. It, it, and again, this is just my opinion, right? But mm -hmm. my def and you said this in the mix of all that. But the short answer is, I use REST unless I have a reason not to use REST. That's that's in other words, I've we sort of, you know, my teams we've said, we just made a decision like well, unless there's a reason, mm -hmm. let's use REST. Now the thing that could disrupt that, in my opinion, is gRPC, which looks really interesting. Um, but you know, SOAP certainly has its value. But SOAP isn't going to be my go-to. It's mm -hmm. it's just more complicated. I could use it. Is there a requirement that leads me to SOAP, right? Chances are not. Chances are I'm starting with REST, and that is – I'm just trying to simplify yeah, and say – Yeah, I think you're right. You know, and, I, and I think that that has become uh, something of – you know what else? It's one of those things where I typically know that the client – and the client might be an internal client, could be an external client of, of this call. Mm -hmm. I get, I expect that they will understand rest and it's easy getting started point. Exactly. Um, that, that last point is, is pretty crucial, right? Cause it's, it's, you know, it's almost become dead simple to be able to, to create a rest service or to talk to a rest service. Yeah, exactly. HTTP so, is easy. And it's, easy. you know, obviously like, well, not, I shouldn't use the word, obviously that was wrong. If Roy Fielding was here, he'd he'd be upset that we are associating REST very closely with HTTP because he's like, that's not you know, REST it's is a this yeah. architectural style, blah blah blah. blah. He's wrong, not wrong. You yeah. could we could very well we could very well create a web API using the ASP.NET stack, and be very remote procedure call, in all of our calls. Yes. yes. And that's and you know whatever. I don't think that's so we what we're be saying. saying HTTP I think I think I think what the three of us are saying is that HTTP is easy. It's mm -hmm. dead simple right. for most people. It's usually first class uh, operations in everyone's stacks now, whether you're yeah. Python or C Sharp or JavaScript. You know, there's ape, there's there's first class, like sometimes stuff really close to the surface in JavaScript, you like make a fetch call and you're done. 
Yeah. And and it's and and it wasn't that way, <laughs> but it is now. Um you're not going to pick soap unless you have to interop with something that picks soap. True. And yeah. I don't even think it's because soap stunk or anything. It's yeah. just that and that's kind of a ironic play on words. Um <laughs> it's that like, look, if you have to do IHE interoperability, which was the integrating the health enterprise standard that mm-hmm. was that was coming along in the in the early 2010s, I think, because that's when I worked on it. They chose soap. And guess what? They're stuck with it. Like IHE is going to use soap. Forever. Um, yes, there's other things coming along in that space. But if you want to do what's called, and I'm, it doesn't really matter what this is, that's called a provide and register, it's a soap call. Like that's the, you're stuck. But we haven't talked much about GraphQL. No. I I feel like GraphQL. Part of its invention was to counteract the tendency you get in an HTTP slash. Let's actually a truer REST API. Where in order to get the answer you want, you query a collection of resources and then drill down to maybe another smaller collection of resources and then finally get to the resource that you want. And it might take you a couple calls. And GraphQL says, why don't, what if we defined up front a specification where you drill down to your answer right away and then, and then we'll, we'll do you one better. We can base it on your, on your, uh, your schema so that it reminds me a little bit of OData, but I don't know if that's, that's what like... I was thinking when you were saying it. I was, I, I was thinking I, about OData. It does, you but I, I don't want to compare it too much to OData because I think OData was hard. And I think that's why it didn't work, is those query strings were hard. Um, you could use a client to help you build them, but now you and I, Andy, are looking in the logs and we're trying to figure out what that OData call was trying to do. And you go, I don't know. What the heck was... Yeah. What were they trying to query again? So I think that's what hurt OData. Um, yeah, and, and, what um, Open Window yeah. put. Um, and this is interesting. Uh, Open Window 365 is saying that it's community related. And, and I believe that. I, I don't I know agree. that, right? But that makes sense because we see that a lot with, with a lot of these things. Uh, where, he, you know, uh, Open Window, uh, he or she is saying, you know, uh, seeing React uh, node applications using GraphQL. Right, um, but not many developers using in, in the .NET. We don't see as much GraphQL. Uh, also, uh, OData is open by default, and GraphQL is closed, meaning OData by default returns all fields. Where GraphQL, you have to ask which fields you want. I um, think that's you're right about this difference. comment. I think you're right about this. Is that for some reason, GraphQL hasn't made its way into the user groups and the forums and maybe, and I hate, boy, I really hope this isn't the case. Is it because there isn't, it is when you go and open the ASP.NET documentation, it's not discussed. And so you're a developer and you're like, well, how do I build this application? Well, I got web API. I guess that's what I'll do. Like, is it, is it really that simple? I don't know. Somewhat. And the naming, of it being called web API. I don't know. That, that doesn't imply that it's rest. Um, so I, I don't know. This is interesting. I, 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 you know, what would be interesting. I don't know how you guys feel about this. I'm not really that familiar with GraphQL. Sounds like a show topic. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, sounds like an interesting show topic. I'd like to see a little bit more about it because it's not something that I, I have a lot of exposure to. Right. Um, yeah, I've seen know. it just enough because I've seen other, bloggers right and he's not wrong uh, a lot of times they are react hey, or node bloggers. Not wrong. yeah you know what you're right thank you for correcting me there um i don't know who open, open window, window is, is open window is not wrong that uh that a lot of times i see somebody super excited about graphql and they do happen to be reactor view and I just wonder if maybe it's because it, it, you said rich it came out of facebook right and I, which i'm mm-hmm. trusting the i think I feel like I vaguely sort of, but I would have lost the, I would have lost the trivia quiz on that one. Um, maybe that's part of it, right? It's in the, it's in the, it's in the Facebook ecosystem, and React is kind of there. And I know it doesn't have anything to do with Facebook, but you figure if that you get exposed to these things, so. Yes, it is from Facebook. So I wonder if um, 
That's interesting too because you have gRPC Google, you have GraphQL uh, Facebook. Yeah. I mean, you just have. It's interesting now. We're we, we're seeing you know sort of competing uh, things coming out of major players, and then and then interestingly, REST is. I, I, I kind of tend to think of it as just not, no one. It's just there, right? But someone invented REST, I guess. I don't know. But um, it's a little bit more, um, I don't know what the word I'm looking for is, but it's just uh, a, a, an accepted standard or something, you know? Yeah. I, I think it is, you know, It's it has become its own standard way of communicating yes. yeah i think that's good yeah. and i don't know if it was it might have been chris was saying this earlier and i think it's an interesting thing to touch upon because we talk about rest we talk about apis uh i've been trying to make a concerted effort to um to stop making restful apis that aren't using the rest that aren't really restful, right? And so I'm trying to do more of that. And maybe this is a, a side topic we can talk about later, but, you know, returning those the status codes that are to be expected from REST and things like that, as opposed to not doing so uh, in my RESTful API. You know, what you I, I think it's interesting, and I don't know if I'm right. I, I could be just making things up here, but, we, you know, REST is a specification, I guess. Is that the right word? A specification. And restful, to me, implies that there's some degree of restfulness that it may have or not have. Um, and I think a lot of people, it's sort of like agile, right? How many people are really agile? Yeah. And how many people are you know, using agile terminology and things like that? I'm trying to make a concerted effort to move from using restful terminology to to being more really restful i th i guess does, does that make sense and is that something that's familiar with you guys are familiar with that kind of thing yeah i i think the term restful came about because people were trying to sidestep the argument of what a rest api is yeah. because uh in fact for a while i used to hear the the term restafarian I'm not sure that was the nicest term in the world, but I, I heard it for a little while to be somebody that was so dogmatic about rest that they would complain that you weren't returning the right code or using the right method. Um, or even, you know, that, uh, the client could not, the rep, that state wasn't being transferred such that the client could, could figure out what the next call to make was, you know, by, by, by some standard, it was thought that your API isn't restful if after the first call, the client couldn't figure out what to do next, therefore, your API must not be RESTful. And uh, I'm sorry, must not be REST-based. So I feel like the RESTful term was where people just threw up their hands and said, I don't really want to take part in the fight. So I I'm mostly resource-based. And if I'm not perfect, then forgive me. Can I move on with the rest of my talk, right? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and I do admit that I'm a little bit weird about this is I try to stick to the term web or HTTP API, which is why I absolutely am not thrilled that there's a product called web API, a language stack, language stack product, because now, now am I talking about ASP.NET web API or am I talking about a web API? Um, but I'm a little weird about that. I, I admit that I, I tend to stick to that wording more and I try to avoid rest because I want, I don't want to say to somebody, I expect this API to not have any RPC-ness or any restness. Like, I don't care. Get, get the work done. Did you done. say RPC? Oh, wait, did you just say, forget that. RPC-ness, RPC-likeness okay. or, or restness. I don't care. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to think about it, right? I, right. I, what makes it attractive is the web was simple. <laughs> to the chagrin of every firewall administrator everywhere, 80 was open. Yeah. <laughs> and right. if you ever wonder maybe why uh, RESTful APIs took off, I think it's because 80 was open. <laughs> right. And, and here we are. Yeah. It's not a bad Yeah, point, definitely. Right? Yeah. It, what's the, the, you know, one of the first discussions you have when you talk about, you know, accessing a service, well, what do we got to open? Is you start the, the nothing. well, I, I remember how it used to be is you had the all hands with the network team, the firewall team, the developers, and the network team, the firewall team, the developers team, 
on the other side and their product managers and probably a C-level vice president or two who said, we are not leaving this call until this service works. Right. I hated those days. <laughs> not that I ever lived anything like that with TCP IP because I did right. and I hated it. So have we gone, you know, yeah, did we, totally miss down, like, enterprise we, started APIs? With, we started with a question, you know, like what are we, what API style are we, do we use? The question from uh, Hector. And I, I think this is, was a good question and it took us down an interesting path. Right. Um, yeah. And I'm just wondering if, if, and at and some point, you know, like we could take the, uh, the approach of like, okay, well, we've we spent time on that. Do we want to keep going down that, or do we want to shift to another topic? I'm, basically, you know, posing that question. Uh, although there's another question in chat. Um, uh, API. I think an enterprise API we wanted to delineate has a specific meaning, right? Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. solving a problem in a way that just an API we that I might hack together. It's something else. Yeah. Is it a product? Gonna, it it definitely is a product, right? Because you want you you're gonna think of it like a product, treat it like a product. Um, that's when we started talking about the versioning, the major and the minor, and all the different ways that you access it. I think the other thing that comes up in this discussion and conversation around enterprise type of APIs is <clears throat> the the word microservices and it doesn't mean you know if you have apis and microservices and vice versa but the idea of i have this this api that i'm creating that talks about our products as a as an organization and all of the developers who need to access information about our products are going to use this api let's say and when we think about the context of that api in the terms of a microservice architecture, what we're doing is we're essentially keeping the context of what that API does so we can limit, um, you know, the amount of, of brain power we have to think about, well, where do I get that data from uh, if I call this API? Um, think of kind of a conversation. I mean, when I when I think about the services that way, I go back to the, you know, the first show we did on solid principles, right? Single responsibility for changing your API you know, it doesn't necessarily do just one thing, but it certainly only has that one responsibility or one reason why it needs to change. And I think that's kind of important here too, because you get the your services down to that small enough level where they're a little bit autonomous. They can be deployed, updated, or I'm sorry, uh, um, iterated on and deployed and, and managed uh, in and of themselves. And they don't have any other dependencies to other services there. Uh, so think of that, uh, um, the ability to not only iterate on them and deploy them, but also have the ability to scale them up and, and out as well. Um, be able to, to handle that individual load without impacting any of the other services around it. And because of all of that, you wind up getting a couple things in that you're able to potentially replace them, right? If I want to try out a new version of my API, I can point to another, um, I'm just basically calling another version of that and the rest of my application still functions because that's the only piece that's changed. In order to make that really happen, then your data also has to be um, managed alongside the microservice as well. That's really important when you think about those. So microservices becomes part of the conversation, especially when you talk to enterprises and they're, they're thinking about microservices anyway. So thoughts? Yeah, so... Yeah. Hmm. So... I, I'm curious to know, like, where is the delineation? Between um, when you when you talk about microservices, I think we that's a that's a pretty significant thing. <laughs> How much more um, time do we have? <laughs> right, right. Yeah, really. um, but if we're talking about an API uh, that has that wants to utilize microservices, and so let's just say we're maybe use this example of so, sort of this mythological uh, dev talk show API, and maybe we have a shows API. And, and Chris was saying, well, we're going to get books, which is, I'm not writing a book, but if you want to write a book, go ahead and we'll have a book API. Now, let's say the shows API has like a list and a details or, you know, I don't know, I'm just trying to think of some, some type of thing, maybe even a post to post data to it. Um, 
At a microservices level, are we talking about splitting those by the by the uh, by the? Well, I guess to use like an MVC kind of terminology, we're talking about the action or the controller. Like how, <laughs> if that makes sense to you guys, how how small are we making these as microservices? Is that is it that the um, the list is a microservice and the details is a totally different microservice? Or I don't. Yeah. So that's that's a good question. Um, and I think part of it comes down to um, that right layer, that domain layer that makes sense to, to demarcate and say, well, this particular. Um, let's let's say at the controller level for just for sake of arguments, right, this particular controller level has enough. Um, has the and give me a second to put the right word together with it, but basically has um, a, has the certain properties to it such that if we want to, um, if we want to expand out the, 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 this particular controller, we can expand that one out and it's not gonna downstream or upstream impact any of the other APIs that are out there. I think that's the point when you start to say this service lives on its own and it's easier to break those services out than to put them back together. So if you realize that I've broken all, you know, I've broken all these services that we've been talking about around shows and books and uh, guests and, and all of those things potentially into different API layers. And maybe that's, that's too granular for what we need to do that it, it's tough to put them all back together. So it's almost better to say, here's our dev talk show API. This in and of itself is going to be that that microservice that we're creating that supports this particular set of uh, APIs for those people who want to subscribe to it, and let's say at some point down the road, the you know we need to branch off the uh, the the video section because it's gotten too uh, too out of hand with all the demand. So we can do that and move that along, and it can scale in and out and be modified as it needs to. Does that help frame? Yeah, I think it does. I think so. I think that's helpful. So, it's part of designing the enterprise API then is this facade so that we actually don't care. If right. it's one if it's one service today, fine. And if later the books, I don't know why this would be the reason, the book side has grown to the point that it needs to be its own service. The callers just call and they don't they don't care. Yeah. And I think your your term of a facade is, you know, ultimately whatever that tool is that manages your APIs, having that um, that capability to basically the client just knows this is my endpoint, and I know that these are the services that are available to me, and I want to subscribe to them or I want to purchase them, however it is that that uh, model works, and I'm just able to to access those. What happens behind the scenes as far as other API styles, other API versioning, other uh, capabilities potentially that might be there. Those, as you mentioned, Chris, those all just are abstracted away from me. I know what the contract is at that facade level and that's all I need to understand. Yeah. Um, so I was trying to think of like, is the reason you build an enterprise API because you know, without one, I'm trying to think of a good, I'm trying to think of some good, like, I, I don't know, product, maybe, maybe let's just say it's like insurance. Without one, you build a website and you build apps to help people sell insurance. But if you have an enterprise API, mm -hmm. then anyone can sell it for you, including some kind of quote gathering website. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's true. Do you want to? Do you want to see a good example of kind of rethinking about APIs from a, an app perspective versus a, a, an enterprise yeah. kind of perspective? Sure. Yeah. While you're switching over to that, I want to take a second here uh, to make sure, just to be full, fully clear, there were some comments in the chat. And due to the timing, I just want to make sure that Open Window doesn't think that I was saying something to them. Open Window said, posted a great link. And I was writing, thanks for the link. And before I hit enter, Open Window posted another comment that says, now I will stop talking about GraphQL. 
And I wasn't saying thanks to that. Okay, open window says we're all still good. I just want to make sure <laughs> the timing of the links, uh, you know, can get you into trouble with some of these things. Timing of the, you know, as the posts come in, right? Um, we also haven't mentioned, should, should we take a minute to do a quick uh, uh, plug for, you know, our YouTube channel and stuff like that? Yeah, you can reach our YouTube channel. It's just youtube.com slash the dev talk show. Uh, we also you can also get there with video.thedevtalkshow.com. And really, uh, you'll see all recordings of every one of the shows there. You know, a few weeks ago we had um, we talked about ASP.NET Core with uh, with Shahed Chudari, who showed us his awesome blog series that he's done for the last couple of years, A to Z. Uh, ASP.NET Core A to Z and his awesome reference project. We've talked about SignalR. We've talked about Code Spaces. We talked about doing all your development in the browser. Um, just a lot of different topics, and we can't wait for you to check them out. If you're watching us on Twitch by going to uh, video.thedevtalkshow.com or just heading over to our YouTube channel there, that's where that take you. Um, if you're watching on Twitch, don't forget to uh, hit the follow button, and you'll know when we go live. And if you're watching on YouTube, hit the subscribe button. You'll know when a new video goes up. You know, Chris, something you say a lot, uh, I'm going to say, because you didn't say it today, you say this a lot, is leave us a comment and tell us yeah. what you like. And the reason I'm thinking that in particular on this show is this is one of those real talk show episodes where the three of us are talking and we're interacting with, with the viewers as well, which is great, right? Sometimes we do demo heavy episodes. Or demo, yeah. Sometimes we do, you know, we, we do a variety of things. I happen to enjoy all of them. I really like these talk ones. Um, quite frankly, where we just, you know, we throw ideas around and uh, we get feedback at the same time and things like that. I tend to like these kind of episodes. Um, I'm curious to know what what uh, everyone else thinks as well. So, yeah. you know, it helps us prepare and, and deliver the right kind of content. But, uh, you know. Yeah. If you're watching in the future on YouTube, let us know in the comments, please. Yeah. Let us know what you like and don't like, and that'll help us out. And uh, back to our regularly scheduled program, right? Uh yeah. So let me uh, let me switch screens here. So what we were going to talk a little bit about next is to kind of tee up the, you know, get us moving away from the versioning to thinking about APIs and moving APIs from, you know, what they might be into something that's more accessible from uh, an enterprise perspective is, and that's not it. Oh, there we go. Uh, so something that, um, uh, uh, we did at Microsoft, which was in, back in the time frame, probably around the 2014, 2015 time frame, right before I joined, where um, we had a number of individual applications. So in this case, here's our Active Directory that had some APIs related to that specific product, right? So we're able to say, here is um, how you might talk to, find out about users, uh, find out about people and groups in our organization. And while that's great, I could talk to those APIs and get that data back. What if I wanted to do something a little different? Maybe I wanted to get uh, extended information about the user profile that wasn't in our Active Directory or the Exchange system. Uh, what if I wanted to get the person's picture and do that all in one client application? Well, now I've got to call two different APIs to make that happen. And whatever authentication mechanisms are in place to get my uh, um, to make my call happen securely. If I want to go ahead and talk and get email and events and things of that nature, there's a second, there's another set of APIs that I've got to call. And then if I want to look at files, well, files could be in SharePoint, files could be in OneDrive. How do I know which is which and what I'm talking to and what I need to get from my application? And what happened was, and then this is just some of the querying that happened when we think about the way we had to query for this data. But when we think about this, there's a whole bunch of different endpoints that happened from an API perspective that as a developer, I had to know what it was I was talking into. And then finally, when you start to think about where we landed with something we call the graph API and that capability of there's one URL you have to hit for any of the apps and services that we have uh, across uh, across all of our products, basically. And this is how you this is how you authenticate. This is how you make those calls. They're all restful or rest, rest based uh, uh, type of calls. And it's a very 
easy way of, of referencing that data. And then this for us has become our, you know, our enterprise API is such that while it started with things that we were doing in the Office 365 space, we've since added the dynamics capabilities and adding those uh, calls into the API, adding calls into Azure as well from uh, uh, being able to get access to um, some of the security information that sits over in the Azure space. So this becomes our, our landscapes. Every developer knows it's graph.microsoft.com and then whatever it is that I'm looking for. So think about that discoverability aspect of it. So is that questions or kind of how does, does that help solidify a little bit kind of what we're thinking of moving from uh, product or even application specific APIs to making it more universal across the organization? Yeah, I may have lost you both. No, I, I understood it. It was that, you know, one reason why something like this was built was instead of having to, it was sort of like kind of what we were talking a little bit earlier about when we were kind of discussing how you make multiple rest calls to get to your answer. Yeah. So in this case, the graph is designed to try and, and help me get to my answer quickly. And, and I guess just from an enterprise, and, and we're not talking about graph specifically, right? But like an right. enterprise API perspective is, can I can I come up with the facade that answers the questions my users really have in their in their applications and, and I get them that answer faster? Right. Yeah, I think I, I think you're I think that's part of it. You're right that yes, we're we're kind of trying to pull those together into one into one call, but also discoverability and and knowing that here's um, Here's how I'm, you know, where I'm going to look for where that data is kind of makes sense, even though behind the scenes, it might not be in the product I think it's in. It's just, uh, it's just made available to me because um, I understand kind of how the API is laid out, if that, if that works. Right. I think we lost Andy, you're on mute. Yeah. Sorry, I wonder how long I've been on mute. Um, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, um, you know, I think Chris actually has a way to put me on mute. Like he sneaks it in there so I don't get to talk. <laughs> I'm just kidding. So yeah, I hit the mute button at some point. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that you guys have, uh, Microsoft has taken this approach with that, the graph being like their sort of branding for, um, for the data. And it's a pretty cool approach. Cause like you said, you kind of know where to go, you know, where things are going to be and they've sort of put a common framework to it or whatever, where it all sort of works the same way. And it's, it's good that way. Mm -hmm. All right. Ooh. So kind of get us a little bit back into the enterprise API discussion, just to kind of, cause thinking about kind of winding this back down a little bit, but we want to think about, um, and maybe I can show this just to kind of bring the, um, Hey, what do you know that works? I do this. And I'm wondering if security is a topic we want to talk about tonight, but you know, we'll let you keep going with that, what you're talking yeah. about. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so, so security is definitely a topic. Um, especially when we think of, uh, um, obviously when, we, so two, a couple of things around that and, and then we'll, we'll go into this, this designing process. Um, thinking about, Internally, you know, when um, and we didn't really talk about this when we when we talked about kind of growing into this, but maybe it's a good way to start. APIs that you typically start out with, you're going to start off most often with something that's private. It's just on your network; your people can see it. You've got to have maybe your, you know, your corporate credentials signed into whatever that is, and use that as a way of of being your key to get access to those APIs. Um, that security layer um, becomes much more important when you start talking about, well, I, not only do I want my customer, or my uh, employees to see those APIs, but I want to start sharing them with my customers or my partners and making certain ones available to one versus the other. So having that ability to not only secure them from accessing and calling those APIs, but also being able to secure who can see what's even available and what, what kind of that footprint is. There might be certain APIs you want to show your partners and certain APIs that you, you know, the same APIs you don't want your customers to see, but you want them to look at other ones to, to, to gain access to. So 
security is going to be up and down everything we talk about here from what's what's shared what's uh what knowledge is, is made out there about them as well as just even securing them on the back end. So whatever tooling you use to, to put in place for that, you've got to have that security layer kind of built into those tool capabilities. I'll pause there in yeah. case you had a different security thought. No, I was just thinking about, you know, there's a variety of ways to secure. I was, you know, thinking that that's a, you know, the idea of having security is important. Uh, it's not always using the, you know, your Windows credentials or your Azure. You know, it's it's it, sometimes it's other things other than that. Yeah. Um, I but mean, but I'd rather. I mean, we can keep going down this. You brought up a slide here, and I think you know you had some stuff to talk about. So I'm I'm fine with that too. You know. Okay. Yeah, and there are standards and and protocols around that security mechanism too. So OpenID and OAuth and all of those kind of standards that are there. So. Um. When we think about moving from just, uh, I've created an API for my application, I'm starting to think about creating APIs for the for the for the overall business. That first layer there around, you know, kind of thinking about that discovery process. Right? What are the what are the core pieces of information that the business team wants and and is interested in? What do they value from a data perspective? Uh, oftentimes, those capabilities and and things that are in the um, the landscape landscape of the business are are places where they might see opportunities to enhance relationship with partners, engage uh, with with more customers, or potentially even have a revenue stream around selling uh, and monetizing that data that they might have. So, including the business team is really really important in that in that first step there about talking about what those capabilities are starting to model out what those APIs might look like, what are the structure of those, actually designing and building out those APIs and mocking them out. Then we start getting into prototyping. And then all of this obviously gets a little bit of a feedback loop going on around as we start to iterate on those. When we're ready to deliver, we can think about pulling those APIs into those microservices that we talked about, um, being able to have a layer where you might have uh, a test. Obviously, you have some kind of test and QA capabilities out there. And then really important there on the delivery side is documentation, right? We talked about Swagger, but there are other uh, similar types of uh, um, frameworks and, and tools out there that can basically describe your APIs and let customers know how they can interact with them. Um, all of that leads to getting these out to production and then ultimately consuming them by whichever of those uh, you know, kind of three or four big, big buckets we think of employees, customers, and partners. So this idea of, you know, don't start with the, you know, the API that you might have created in your app, even though that might have some data in it that would be, make sense to bubble up to, to an enterprise level, really involve the business team, because that's where the ideas and, and a lot of the, um, the real capabilities can be um, uncovered. So again, it's a talk show. Thoughts? I think this this um, this slide is a is a good thing, and like you bring up a lot of good topics that you know we're talking about, like what to consider when we're building an API, and 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 um, you know there's there's some there's some steps to take along the way, and I, and I think it's it's kind of good. You, you know, you mentioned like obviously the testing, and I think people are kind of used to that, but you talk about getting your product people involved in the beginning and things like that, and and I think that's good. Now the, the question in the chat um interesting because the 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 stream is delayed a little bit and it came in right as you were saying it and i just think i don't know if that was really good coincidence you were talking about <laughs> uh documentation and open window uh at least on my screen my version of of twitch is maybe behind or ahead of other people's but uh yeah here it is up in the uh featured chat uh you know do you have any recommendation for api documentation and open window uses Redoc, uh, which I think it sounds interesting. You know, uh, they're saying it is more modern uh, looking, I guess, right? More modern, but lacking a built API request. Oh, it doesn't have the testing, right? It doesn't have the, the, the API testing built in, but Swagger doesn't look as modern. I think that's interesting. Um, I'm not that familiar with Redoc. I'm familiar with Swagger. Yes. Yeah, um, using it because it is again something of a simple to get started with standard and stuff like that i was going to take a peek at redoc rich do you have any um you mentioned that no, there was, are others yeah i was looking at um 
and aside from Swagger, the other two I haven't heard of. Um, there's Raml, R A M L, and Blueprint are some of the other um, formats uh, that that are kind of listed in um, some of the the documentation that I have. So, but that's not. I, I think Redoc I've heard of, but I've not had any any chance to to play around with that at all. But that might be when I. When I Google it, by the way, I get Redoc Lee. Uh, there's a, um, I, I assume that's, there's also something called Red. Oh, it does say Redoc Interactive Demo. So maybe um, it's Redoc.ly the and then so, so, some the chat. Yeah. Sorry, I'm behind here. Uh, yeah. So it is this Redoc Lee. Okay, right. And then it's like a Redoc. Uh, um, they're worth checking out. Definitely. Uh, let me see. No, it's cool. I mean, I, I hadn't heard of Redoc myself, but looking at it and seeing, you know, that they're showing uh, generated documentation that that's also mobile ready, but to uh, open Windows Point, um, and I'm going to just take their word for it. No uh, built-in API request testing. So. Right. But this is a great example, uh, Open Window. I, I want to say thanks. This is the part of the show that I think a lot of us, we really enjoy is like learning things from you Yeah. Uh, along the way. While we, 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 we are here, we're sort of helping each other, right? We're all learning from each other and we're building a community where we really all uh, contribute. And um, we like it when the show isn't exactly, you know, sort of one-sided or in our case, we could say it's a three-sided show because the three of us you know consuming it but we know that uh that viewers have you know just as much or more knowledge on a lot of these topics than we do and so it's really great appreciate your sharing these things with us and i'd like to take a look more at redoc yeah um pretty cool the testing part isn't the you know isn't the be you know like that's not the only feature that's important right right um so you know, it really depends, I think, on what you, what your uses are. And there's probably others as well, you know. Um, now, Redoc does say it's the open API specification. Um, and so if that's the case. I think, no, I think the, the rest of that sentence is that um, formerly known as. Oh, I'm sorry. You're right. Never mind. I read that wrong, no. too. Go ahead. I'll let you. Finish. No, I'm not just. I wasn't really saying much. I'm just saying if it's a, is it is that mean it's the same specification? I was sort of asking like is that uh, the API is documented in open API format and is based on pet store sample provided by Swagger IO team. Um, it was extended to illustrate features of I mean blah blah blah. I'm not going to read everything on their site. I'm just clicking through and looking around here. Um, yeah, that's that. We want to share a screen and we can show what we're all looking at at the same time. This is I'm looking I mean, at this, this what, uh, pet example. This is this this is where I thought you were going because I was looking at this paragraph. No, I was I I clicked the link that uh, that was shared in our in our chat. I clicked on the um, oh. open window posted this one about yeah. The, uh, I mean, there's a there's a GitHub repo with Redoc, but it feels to me like Redocly, you know is saying, hey, we've got more services. Redoc is one of them. Right. And then an open API CLI, which I actually hadn't heard of. And hey, you know, CLIs are, that's all the rage, man. There's an Azure CLI, React CLI, .NET CLI. So it's cool stuff. Anyways, yeah, this is pretty interesting. I, um, Hadn't heard of it, but it, Redocly looks like, um, and I'm not, you know, this isn't a negative, is Redoc as a service plus maybe some other things. There's a free plan, a basic plan, professional plan. So why not? Yeah, yeah. It basically is just a, it's just a JavaScript library that that displays the Swagger JSON in a, in a nice UI, according to Open Window here. So it, it, I guess it all sort of works together, basically, you know. Um, and maybe you can use... 
swagger, you know, sometime, I mean, who knows, maybe, maybe they all play nice together and you can just use the, the UI you want to use for a particular time. If you're doing testing or not, I don't know. Uh, it used to be open source. Not sure if they made it as a light, a paid license. Yeah. So who knows? Interesting. I don't know. There's um, more to you do generating the docs, right? And that's, I think what redoc lead as a service is coming around and saying, yeah, sure. You know, but, but let's let's offer you features that i mean we talked a lot about not having to manage your own stuff right and not mm -hmm. having to manage your own infra infrastructure and, and and you know setting up your own site to host the redockly docs and maybe they just take all care of it for you and you say like yep we're on to our next problem i think yeah. it's funny is that like there was a there was a, a bit of sort of silence on the show here i think where like when we get a UR, we get a link and we're looking at it and we're like, how do we talk about this thing that we've never heard of? Oh, yeah, like, sure. How do we scan all scanning really quickly through the website? Like, what do we see that like jumps out at us that we can we can talk about? Um, and it's hard. It's really hard to uh, to um, to, you know, read and talk and all these kind of things at the same time. Um, but that doesn't mean it's not a good thing. It's just. I just think it's kind of funny. Oh, that that's cool. Sort of I, that. I'm actually glad I learned about Redockly tonight, so I'm excited. That's yeah, good. same. Yeah. Um, I think that the last thing I'll say is just to, um, you know, when we think about, well, two things. One is when we think about these being products, there's a life cycle to them, right? Maybe I can drop into my screen again here. And just basically be able to say that, you know, there's a life cycle to it, right? And if I do... See, I don't want to lose the. I only have one screen here when I do this, but basically, we talk, we think about That's things okay. that are in that. Yep, yeah, in the. Uh, it's just this part. I can get rid of. I can do that. Yes, cool. Um, think about the things that were in that flow diagram that we just looked at about before. But having much like any application, right? Discover, do your design, start to deliver it out, release that to production. You share it out with people, and that leads them to have updates, bug fixes, things they want to do to enhance, and then we continue around this life cycle, and that is true for applications, it's true for the, um, the APIs that we're, we're talking about here. And you know they're just like the regular products you might create. At some point, just like an application, you're gonna wanna retire it. So being able to either move it onto a new version or be able to move it uh, to, um, to uh, um, move it out of uh, circulation and put those resources to other use. Um, Wait, we're allowed to retire applications? <laughs> Apparently that's planned. Apparently you yeah. plan to retire. <laughs> you know, I, 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 it's great that you're, you're showing this. Um, this is one of those things though. This is, this is hard if I'm being honest, yeah. right? Sure. Uh, we tend to focus on the flat version of the story instead of the loop version of this story. Uh, as developers, I think a lot of product teams, a lot of organizations, this iterative part of it, I mean, when we talk about DevOps, you know, DevOps is, again, is that same concept where it's supposed to be, they often show it as that figure eight, but coming back and getting the feedback and then modifying your application, or in this case, your API, yeah. it's really so important. It's so important to, to continue these kind of things. Uh, it's very easy to not do that. I think it's very easy to sort of go, well, we did it um and we're done right and i think i think it takes a little bit of discipline but i think this is this is the right thing to do yeah and it's yeah. the same kind of discipline you would have in your in your regular applications right we got to make sure all throughout this we've done testing unit testing integration testing and so on we've done monitoring we've got some kind of telemetry or, or understanding of how our how our just like we would our websites, how are APIs being used? Are we running into problems? What are those problems? How can we how can we understand and fix them uh, so that we get better service to wherever our customers are, customers, employees, partners, what have you? So all of those same things that we think about from an app perspective, we need to do them with the APIs too. Yeah, I think Andy's just saying like retire code. <laughs> He's really? stuck on that one. He's stuck on that. Yeah. <laughs> when does that happen? No. Oh, but the, you know what's funny is when you when I saw that I I fixated on that part of the diagram too at the beginning, but I thought of it in a different way. I said like yes because every day we sit down and we write legacy code. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. That's Everybody it. thinks that they don't work on legacy code is wrong because they're working on it now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
which is interesting, right? We could get to Michael Feather's definition is code without tests is legacy code. So well, yeah. that's like a, that, that's a whole interesting show there too. So, uh, cool. So think of that from a really... cycle. And then if you're um, thinking about putting this in your organization, right, there are certain, uh, governance terms, things to, to consider as you start to build this out, right? Cause we're not used to writing or thinking about the APIs that we do for our applications in, in, that reusable, that scalable kind of manner. Uh, so start thinking about, you know, what can you do to the coach development teams and make them and make them aware that, hey, the APIs you're you're writing or could be writing here, you know, or you know, maybe they're writing one that wants that that is going to be directed to be an enterprise one. That how that's different from doing it for their app. Uh, obviously, training material and all those components around that is really important. Um, we talked about discoverability, right? Being able to make sure that as APIs get created that it's easy for the developers who are going to consume them to understand how those uh, APIs might be put together. Uh, style guide. I know Andy, that's a, a you know something that we've talked about on the show before. You know how is it that developers need to put their APIs together just like they would their regular applications? Uh, are there common policies that need to be put in place, like making sure that you know the people who hit your API, you know have a limit uh so many so many calls per second uh maybe it's done by you know a, a key that identifies who that consumer that api is maybe it's done by ip addresses you know what are those policies we want to make sure get put in place and then finally even though we have policies and we talked about governance as we walk through these these bullets here it's got to be flexible at the end of the day there you know this is an evolving set of processes and, and things that we're putting in place so we need to have an understanding of where we can be flexible and how, how we get changes to that process get made. So the last two or three slides here is all really kind of thinking of where we're going from an a, from an enterprise into an enterprise uh, architecture around APIs. These are some of the things to consider and think about as you start to move your organization in that direction. You know, you got me thinking. Um, yeah. We talk a lot about how this show, you know, we focus a lot on, on and what we can learn here and kind of take to work um or in our projects and and it's uh, i i've been thinking more about like there are some without you know going into a bunch of detail there are some there are some products that i know of in my organization that could probably benefit from a good strong api to uh to i don't know if i want to say control them i don't know if that's it just to expose their capabilities mm-hmm so they can be accessed by anyone. Is somebody even writing a, you know, a, a lot of people know languages like Python, and you can bang out a Python script, and it can call an eight, call this API, and maybe command, you know, the product without us even having to know what you wanted to do. Yeah, so. I think it. I, I think it goes back to that. You know, what are the, what's the business value in that API that you're creating? Right? Is there one? Is there does it because what you're doing is, you know, you're adding complexity between, you know, updating security management of what was a set of features that were part of a, you know, a single or maybe a couple of applications. So, you know, is there value in doing that internally or externally? Right. Cool. Pretty nice. Um, went a lot of different ways, right? Yeah. Didn't go the way I thought uh, it was going to go. That's yeah. <laughs> You know, I, I think we're, I, I, I sense that we're headed towards that wrap up part of the show, but there is an yeah, interesting question about um, another potential topic. Um, this eShop on containers uh, sample from Microsoft. I'm not familiar with it. Uh, I don't know if, if, if you guys are. Um, might be something worth taking a look at. I have seen it. I'm trying to remember if I saw it in the context of Azure DevOps demos. I think, Poss I thought, it was, but, oh. I thought it was but I could be wrong about that. I could be yeah, wrong about that. Yeah. The, the question is talking about, you know, containers. Oh, no, that, yeah, I, could be I agree. I'm just saying, I'm just saying that I think that might've been my familiarity with it is somebody used it to create an Azure DevOps demo. Not that it's about Azure DevOps. Yeah, it might've been the content that they were deploying through DevOps right. or something like that. Right. So yeah, I, I'm interested in, in, uh, Take a look at that. Yeah, I think it was also part of a book. Oh, like yeah. It was a services book that came out, if I'm not mistaken, a long ago. Hmm. 
Could be. It's, yeah, it was updated 15 it hours ago, right. so it must still be used. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and you know what? We got a lot of great topic ideas from our guests in chat tonight, which is good. Because yes. we have no excuses when we sit around planning what the, like, the next couple of shows will be. And speaking of which, you catch us at 8.30 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time uh, here on the Dev Talk Show. We were live on Twitch. We love it when people join us live. Um, and if you chat with us, we absolutely love that. But really, we're just glad you're here. So don't feel don't feel like uh, we don't value your presence and your time if um, if we just don't happen to see you in the chat. I know a, a lot of a lot of friends um, watch the show and sometimes uh, just maybe you just want to listen, which is absolutely fine. And if you're watching us on YouTube, we feel the same way. Thank you for watching. If you've got anything you want to talk about, um, definitely uh, hit us in the comments below. And yeah, that's absolutely true. Um, <clears throat> the three of us are in the Philly.net community. And in this strange time right now, we're not seeing those in-person meetups, which I think we all probably miss quite a bit. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but here we are. That's, that's, kind of, that's partially why I think we're trying to spend a little bit more time online so um glad to hear glad to hear how you met us and uh in just a couple of weeks there will be a time change here so if you're watching live and you are not in a daylight saving u.s daylight savings time zone changing placey area thingy then we'll move so just keep that in mind we'll move uh an hour right after halloween I believe that's correct. Right after the Halloween, yeah. uh, October 31st. Uh, is it that weekend? Halloween's a Saturday. So does that mean it's that same actual weekend? It is. It it's might. The, it's the first November show will be, we fall an hour okay. back. Yeah. So right after Halloween, right after we, we will get an extra hour, which is interesting. I used to always reserve that night, the fall back. <laughs> I, I don't do it every year. You've said this before. Have I told you guys this before? That's how you do gaming. Like I like overnight. to try. I say I get some friends, and I say, "Oh, tonight's the night. We're gonna play, we're gonna game all night." And then we hit two o'clock. It goes back to one, and right. then we march to two again. And I go, "All right, an extra hour." It's a great idea. Let's see if it happens. It's a great idea. Are we gonna do a, a Halloween show? We're we gonna do like costumes or something <laughs> like that. We should do, we should have That's theme shows. You know, we'll have to see what we're doing next week. Um, make sure you follow us on Twitter uh the dev talk show and uh we should get an announcement up about next week's show we've kicked around some ideas um i don't know if we should keep them to ourselves or maybe next week we might spend a little bit more time in an ide hmm. and i said might so maybe we decide to do something different but i know i've been both of us have a couple shows that we can uh can go to but i didn't think i just don't think tonight we were ready to to pick one so yeah. all right i like this show i, I like these this is the dev talk show. And so we did some talking tonight and I like that. Yeah. All right. Novel idea. All right. Well, Hey, that'll do it. Thank you very much. A little bit longer of a show. Appreciate everybody who stayed with us or just watched us. Please. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining us, whether it's YouTube or Twitch. So for my co-host Andy Schwamm and Rich Ross, I'm Chris Gomez and we will see you next week on the dev talk show. <laughs>